Welcome back guys. Today I'm going to show you how I light a coal forge and some of the basics of using a coal forge every day. Alright, starting a coal fire is a lot like starting a campfire <clears throat> with one minor difference. So the first thing I do is clean out all the crap that was in there from the previous day's forge. If you've never lit a coal for fire, bleh, if you've never lit a coal forge before, you don't have to worry about this step because there won't be anything in here. So the next thing to start with is a little bit of green coal. Not very much. Just make a nice bed of nice clean new coal in the bottom. This will greatly help your fire. <clears throat> then the rest of it is just like starting a campfire. See, I got some twigs, and some leaves, and some pine straw. If you don't have twigs, leaves, and pine straw, newspaper, and cardboard, both, not just one, you can get away with just cardboard, but newspaper and cardboard will also work. <clears throat> so once you have this in the fire pot, before you light it up, whether you're starting with the previous day's coal, or all brand new, green coal. Stack it up around where your fire is going to be. Don't pile it on top. Okay. Right. Kind of make it into a bowl. You take your lighter. Light from the bottom. Kind of hold your tinder up a little bit. To give the fire some room to spread and collect. Once you've got it going a little bit, get a little air to it. to catch. Take a little bit, start putting it on the top just a little bit. You don't want to smother it out. Get your air going. Now that we got some good flames going, now we can start piling more on top. Along with some green coal, which I've got over here. It's all green coal. Nice thing about having this big old champion 400 blower, as opposed to the smaller blower on the little forge over there. This thing creates some serious air volume without having to really crank very hard. <clears throat> One of the mistakes beginners make a lot is they're shy about the amount of coal they put on their table. There's a reason why your forge table is big and it's deep. Pile it up. As you can see this getting hotter, one of the things you'll see start happening is the coal around the outsides start smoking, right? <clears throat> It'll start coking up while it's not in your fire, so you don't have all the dirty and organics getting into your fire. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so obviously you can see how dirty this fire is. 
when you're first burning coal, it is very dirty. The idea is that we don't want to be burning coal, we want to be burning coke. So what is coke? Coke is to coal what charcoal is to wood. When you burn wood all the way down until it's just coals left, it's lumps of pure carbon that burn really hot and very clean. There's very little smoke once you get down to coals. Coke versus coal is the same thing. When you burn it down to the coke, it burns very clean. You'll see the difference. So this is, you know, a dark orangish fire, lots and lots of black smoke. You'll start seeing yellow smoke and green smoke coming out of here. Those are sulfur dioxide and other organic compounds and inorganic compounds burning out of the coal. Once that's all gone, you won't see it anymore, and you'll see lots and lots of blue flame where it's burning really hot and very, very clean. That's what we're after. See this green smoke here? That's sulfur dioxide. Now if you watch, I don't know how well you can see it, as I'm cranking, you'll see smoke coming out from out here, right? As I was talking about built, you know, burning coal into coke and making coke production, ideally once you have the center of your fire burning hot and clean, you don't want to dump more green coal in the back and right on top of it and get the, all that dirty crap back into your fire. If you can get all of your coal to coke up out here, where the air pressure from the blower is going to blow all that smoke away from your hot metal and everything you have in the center, then you can keep scraping clean fuel into the center as you burn. As this fire burns down, you need to put more fuel into it. So instead of waiting until it burns almost out, all out and piling new fuel on it, constantly be coking up new fuel and scooching in towards the center a little bit as you go all throughout the course of the day. That way you never have to stop and you always have a clean hot fire. <clears throat> new running a coal forge and you don't have a fire rake, it should be the first thing that you forge in your new coal forge. So now the reason I was talking earlier, when you first light your forge, not to pile everything on top of it, you want to kind of make it into a into a bowl, like a little volcano, is you don't want to smother it for air. Once you get all your leaves and your twigs burning, they start getting nice and hot, producing their own coals, they start lighting up the inside of that little bowl. Once you actually get the actual coal itself on fire, and it's burning really good and hot, you know, it's it'll burn much hotter. Once it starts going, then you can start piling things over the top. Once you get a really good burn going, then you can just heap everything right on top and then get it all nice and coked up. See how big these pieces here on top are getting? These start off as tiny little nuggets like this or pieces like that and they will just get huge and break apart. And that's what's turning into your actual coke which you know becomes your nice clean fuel that burns really 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 hot. That's what we're actually after. But when you're first starting up you don't want to smother it so you got to be careful. Okay. By now you can see all the smoke that's coming out from the edges around here. <clears throat> that's all coke production that's happening outside of your fire, which is essentially what you want. So right now the center of this fire is burning nice and clean. I can put a piece of steel in there, I can put a piece of Damascus in there, and I don't have to worry about the sulfur dioxide. It's the biggest thing you have to worry about. When your steel starts getting hot, sulfur dioxide will work its way into the steel, and the sulfur will cause the steel to become very, very brittle, which is not something you want to do. So you've got to be careful about it. If it's happening from the outside and you have positive air blast coming in from the bottom, blowing everything out, you don't have to worry about the carbon or the sulfur dioxide getting into your steel. So now this is nice and clean in the center. We can put a piece of steel in here and start working and just slowly, as the fire collapses, slowly bring this new coke that's forming up here on the edges 
into the top and use that as fuel without having to worry about polluting our fire. And we can do this all day long without having to stop. If you let your fire burn all the way down into the fire pot, one, you're wearing your fire pot out much faster, right? You're causing it to corrode quicker. The more you heat it up, the more it will oxidize, which is rust for steel. And the more it will go away over time. Like it will, it will slowly disintegrate over time. So you want to keep your fire out of the fire pit. You want fire pots. You want to build it up as much as possible. Um, also, if you burn your fire all the way down to the point where you don't have very much fuel left, then you have to pile all new green fuel on top of it. Then you have to sit here and wait and crank your blower and let it burn until it all cleans out. And that's lost work time instead of just being able to slowly pile more in. Also, if you have a readily available uh, amount of usable fuel that's already nice and clean around the sides, when you get to doing something like forge welding, you don't ever want to be trying to forge weld down into the bottom of your pot. For a little bit later, we'll discuss about the layers of a fire. You want to build it up as much as you can. Get up out of the fire pot and then pile a whole bunch of fuel on top of it. So if your fire is a pyramid, you're burning up here, not all the way down here. So, <clears throat> which we might as well discuss that now. The reason for that being is there's three layers to a fire. The closer you are to the, the tweer down here where the oxygen comes in, that's the oxygen oxygenizing oxygenating layer. Oxidizing, that's the word. Oxidizing layer. Uh, much more oxygen is put, coming in down there that's not burnt up by the fuel yet. When your piece of metal is very, very hot, the oxygen will react to it much quicker. It will oxidize much faster. It will scale up much quicker. And if you're trying to do something a forge weld, scale is the enemy of forge weld. If you get a layer of scale between your two pieces of steel, it'll never stick. You get a little bit higher up on the fire pot. Again, if you picture it like a pyramid, right? If you're about the middle, that's the neutral layer where all the oxygen has been burnt off, but you're not in a, uh, what welders call a carburizing environment, or what blacksmiths call a, what are they called again? There's a totally different word that they use for it. A reducing atmosphere. Which is actually where you want to be. You want to be either in the neutral layer, or you want to be above that in the reducing atmosphere. In the reducing atmosphere, there's more carbon dioxide than there is oxygen. So instead of actually losing carbon, you're getting a little bit more in there. A really good place to be is just on the boundary layer between the reducing atmosphere and the neutral atmosphere. At this point, because there's no usable oxygen to oxidize the steel with, you can actually bring it up to above a welding temperature without burning it, as long as it falls below, just below welding temperature as you pull it out of the fire. So if you're cranking, you get up above welding temperature, you leave it there, stop cranking, by the time you grab your tongs and pull it out, you'll be at a really, really, really high welding temperature. So that's another reason why you don't want to be burning your fire down into your fire pit. I like to work if my fire pit is this deep, I like to work about level with my fire pit. I don't want to be down inside of it, unless I'm doing forge welding and stuff, in which case I want to be way up above my fire pit, my fire pot. Unless I'm dealing with very, very small, fine, detailed work with small pieces, then I'll let my fire burn down a little bit into the fire pot and then stick a whole bunch in there. And if those are usually pieces that are so small, you don't have to crank the blower. Cast a little shadow here so you can see this just a little bit better. The morning sun's coming out, so it's kind of harshing my mood a little bit. Okay, aside from this little bit here, you notice when the blower is turning, oxygen is coming through, there's no dirty yellow flames in the center, right? See how clean that is. If this camera was a little better, you'd be able to see a little bit of blue flame coming out. You see the smoke coming out around the edges. This is where this fuel is turning into coke on the outside of the fire. The inside of the fire is nice and clean. Now that there's no, you know, blow going, you can see the edges producing the dirty yellow flame, as opposed to... Nice clean fire. So that's what you're shooting for. And as you work during the course of the day, as I said, you know, scoop more fuel up, build yourself a little pyramid around there, let it, you know, burn out and coke out around here. See these pieces here? This is all from coke production that's going on on the outside. This is what you want. And as you burn down your fire pit, oops, as you burn, I'm holding a sign against the sun to uh, so you can see this a little bit better. Damn morning sun. Anyway, as this burns down, you want to be able to scoop new fuel right up on top of it and be able to keep going with a nice, clean burning environment. So, there you go. This is what we call clinker. I don't know how well you can see that. This piece is pretty yellow. They're usually a lot more white. What clinker is, is this is pretty much glass at this point. It's really, 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 really hard, but it's brittle like most things, right? Clinker is the silicates, sand, uh, rock inclusions, and a bunch of other leftover waste that gets burnt in the forge, 
collects at the bottom and turns into this glass-like substance that you'll find around down by the bottom of the fire pit. Every once in a while, especially if you've been, when you first start up the forge and you're doing some regular forging operations for an hour or two, if you want to do forge welding, it's important to clean your fire out. One of the first things you want to do is take your fire rake and dig down into the corners of your fire pot. To use the actual forge table as an analogy for the fire pot itself, if it's shaped like this, you need to get down starting in the corners and don't dig towards the center and don't smash it up. Try to hook underneath them, drag them to the sides and yank them out. And you can actually do this by reaching down into your fire pit like this and scooping with your forge rake, right? Some people like to put a point on theirs. I need to put a point on this one, I just haven't gotten around to it. But you'd be surprised just by sticking this in there how far you can get in there and move things around and dig and get into the corners and pull that clinker out. And the reason why you want to pull the clinker out, <clears throat> this sounds like a very strange phenomenon, but this is true. The clinker will actually absorb a crazy amount of heat from your forge and it'll get to the point where it becomes difficult to even heat a piece of steel in the forge. If you've got a piece in there and you're cranking away, or if you have an electric blower and you're cranking it up and cranking it up and your piece just, you can't, you know, it comes out darker and darker and darker every heat, no matter how much you put the blower on, you need to stop what you're doing and dig that, dig the clinkers out of that fire. And I guarantee you're going to find some huge ones. At the end of every day, you know, I'll find clinkers all over the place, usually little small ones, depending on how dirty the coal is. I've had times where I've, I've dug the fire out at the end of the day and found one huge clinker that was ringed all the way around the bottom of the fire pit. That especially happens if you do a lot of high heat operations, like using a lot of big pieces of steel, like making hammers, or if you're doing a lot of forge welding, like making axes. I don't know if you can see behind me on the table, I got a bunch of axes and axe blanks and stuff. If you're cranking crazy amounts of heat, putting lots and lots of coal through there, you're gonna collect a lot of clinker, but it's important to clean that out. So, like I said, if you find your forge just isn't producing very much heat, which for a coal forge, coal forges are insanely hot. So you'll find out real fast, if all of a sudden you just can't seem to produce much heat, you need to take the clinkers out of your out of your fire. So, and as I said, you want to clean the fire out before you forge weld. Clean all that crap out. Get a whole bunch of new coke in there and pile it up high. Like I said, you want to be you want to be working out of the <coughs> out of the fire pit, especially for forge welding. So these are pieces of clinker that collect in the bottom. I didn't discuss, which I was going to mention really quick, uh, is if you're new to forging and blacksmithing and, and uh, especially using a coal forge, where do you get coal? Um, I get coal from a local gentleman here. Right now I'm in Louisiana. I travel full time, so as I go around, I have to source from different places. A uh, gentleman up the road here who's a member of the local blacksmithing guild. And that's the important thing. Find your local blacksmithing guild. Somebody there will be selling coal. The, the guild itself may be selling coal. Like when I go up to Maryland, the what is it, the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay Area Forge Council, or the guys I get my coal from there, I believe I said that correctly. Um, their actual club brings it in and sells it. So if you go to the Abana website, abana.org, A-B-A-N-A, -A, they are the Artists and Blacksmith Association of North America. At the top of the page is a link that says affiliates. Click that link, you will get, it'll bring you to a page that has a map and a list. Look at the list. The map is not always accurate. Not all the clubs that are shown on the list show up on the map. I don't know why. Um, just about every blacksmithing guild in the country will be a chapter member of a banner. So that's the easiest way to find them. Find your local chapter um, and give them a call or drop them an email and tell them you're looking for coal. They'll be able to hook you up. Um, and also, if you're not working with your local blacksmithing guild, if you're not you know, learning from these guys, or if you're more advanced smith teaching some of these people and hanging out, you really need to be making contact with them. So there we go. That's the basics of lighting and using a coal forge for day-to-day -day production. If you guys have any other questions, if I miss something, please, by all means, please feel free to comment. I will either answer your comment or I'll make an entirely new video just to address your question if it's in-depth enough. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. Please like and share on your social media and hit the subscribe button if you're not already. And uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day.